Hello, thank you for tuning in. It's Linda here and little Minnie in her box bed. I have a quick favor to ask you. Please, please, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. Over 50% of my viewers don't subscribe and that's probably because they need a reminder just like this. So please click that button. I would really appreciate it. It will boost the overall status of the channel and it will give me that extra little bit of motivation to keep producing great content for you. Thank you so much in advance and let's get to the workout. Hello, I'm Linda from Baladi's Body Blitz and here's little Mini looking all cute on the sofa for you. Today we're doing a walk and talk. Yes, people, it's a walk and talk, so I will be chatting to you the entire workout. If you do not want one of these, then choose one of my other workouts that haven't got walk and talk in the title or just mute me and listen to your own music. We are going to be chatting about cellulite today, which is a topic that a lot of people are interested in, including myself. So while we do that, we're going to be changing exercises every 60 seconds. The first interval, we are going to be walking in place. So come and join me. Anytime you don't like the next exercise, just come back to walking. And if you wanna walk around the room, rather than just staying in, in place, you can definitely do that as well. Now, if you have a step monitor on your wrist, you wanna be swinging those arms. And if you're walking on the spot like me, then just pick up those knees, may as well get a little bit more of a calorie burn going. Keep your tummy in, chest proud, and a nice smile on your face because it should feel good to get moving. Now, let me just double check where we're at with our steps. 2,600, which means 3,000 steps is 5,600. Drum it in because I don't want to shortchange you. So we're gonna be doing a lot of different moves today, general stepping moves, but also a few squats and a few more toning type moves. So look out for those as well. Give you a little bit of extra burn. And we're going to start with a little step touch. Step touch, now you can do it really kind of plain like this, or you can put, do it a little bit more up and down and dancey and boppy. It really is up to you. I think I'm gonna to stick to this one. And let's start talking about cellulite. So we all know what it looks like. It's that dimply orange peel type fat that generally is deposited around the thighs, the hips, the butt, and is mostly an issue for women. So what actually is it? We know it's fat, but why is it so dimply? Well, recently I found out it's not so much the fat itself that's an issue, it's the skin that's not holding the fat flat. So the skin all over your body is supposed to have this nice tight corset type structure to hold your fat in and keep it nice and smooth. And it does a great job in most areas. So let's do heels in front. So, you know, on your arms or anywhere else, on your tummy even where there's fat. In most cases, you don't get cellulite. It just seems to gravitate towards those lower areas. And that is probably just a biological thing to do with, you know, childbearing. Storing fat there is just the body's preferred position. So with cellulite, there are a number of things that you can do to minimize it, reduce it, help it out. And we're gonna talk about a few of those, going from just like eating properly to make sure you're not depositing extra toxins in your fat, doing things like lymphatic drainage, making sure your circulation is on point, so we're gonna try and talk about all these little things, hopefully give you some tips so that you can start to reduce, let's go into butt kick, that cellulite. Now, unfortunately, I don't think it is possible to totally get rid of cellulite unless you have some sort of invasive procedure like liposuction. And they've got these other ones nowadays where you can kind of melt it and do all sorts of laser stuff to it. Um, so if that is the route you want to go, then I think there's quite a good success rate with that. But if you're not really that bothered by it, it's just a little bit here and there, and you're not one to go under the knife easily, like I definitely am not, then you might want to consider some other options. Having said that, there are a lot of gimmicks on the market. I'm sure you've seen all of those creams 
with caffeine and chili and all sorts of extracts in them that are supposed to get rid of cellulite by kind of burning it away almost. Let's go two across and two to the side. I'm not so sure about them. I haven't tried them myself, so I can't vouch for it, but it kind of seems like a bit of a gimmick to me. Having said that, because it is very much a skin related issue, that the skin is damaged and is not holding the fat in the way it should, I'm sure there are some creams that can help, just like there are certain creams that help on your face. But my question is, would you have to keep using those creams forever in order to keep that same effect? And if that is the case, is there another way that you could perhaps benefit your skin so that you don't need to spend money on expensive creams? So something that I kind of came across recently when I looked into cellulite, let's go into a little bit of a Squat, sending your glutes towards the back wall. Weight is in the heels. I like to hinge forward so that the weight goes into the heels and activates the glutes more. You can keep it pretty shallow if you prefer. So something that I recently came across, and I'm not sure how studied this is, but it kind of made sense to me, is that toxins that you eat or that you're exposed to in the environment get stored in fat. Your body is very smart. It wants to keep you healthy. And by storing those toxins and locking them away in fat cells, it's stopping them from wreaking havoc in your body. So because we are living in an environment that is so highly toxic, everywhere around us we have got synthetic substances in our food, let's go a little hip twist, hip twist. So there's all these synthetic substances that are emitting toxins that we're exposed to every day. Even in our food, unfortunately our governments are not keeping us safe a lot of the time. They say a small amount of this and a small amount of that is okay, but if we're getting a small amount of this, this and this and this and this and this, and this every single day, it adds up, right? And then it's not a small amount anymore. So how does your body get rid of all of this? It is very clever and in some cases it can actually eliminate a lot of stuff through the liver, through the kidneys. But there are some substances, they're actually called phytoestrogens and I'm not gonna get technical here at all, but you can definitely look it up. Um, look up some cellulite videos on YouTube and they'll give you more of the scientific terms. Let's go step, 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 and then four across, across, across. So four of each. So these phytoestrogens tend to get stored in the fat cells. And that to me would make sense why they're so dimply. You know, it just would make sense that it's not normal fat and that somehow it's hardened and it causes those bumps. Now this is just kind of what I've gathered. Sorry if I'm messing up my steps because it's hard to count while I'm also talking. So just do as I say, not as I do. So that could possibly be part of the reason why it's so dimply. And that would also then make sense that if you have less toxins in your life, less pollutants, less phytoestrogens, that you would have less of that fat, right? Okay, let's go grapevine. Step behind, step together. If you don't wanna do grapevine, you can do step together, step together, just two steps again. So if you start to look at reducing your toxic load, and then obviously not just reducing it so you don't make more, but also looking to get rid of some of that fat by detoxing, and lymphatic drainage to make sure that all of your detox pathways are open, then it can definitely help you overall with your health, number one, but also with the battle against cellulite. So what's good for detox? 
you might ask. Well, obviously eating a diet that is extremely unprocessed, as close to nature as possible, that is one thing. Let's go across, across, and then two butt kicks. Across, across, butt kick, butt kick. So the diet is extremely important. Water as well, making sure you're drinking pure filtered water. Your vitamins, making sure that you're getting all of your blood work checked to make sure you're not deficient in something. And then doing things like rebounding, because jumping around is an amazing way of draining the lymph. Also, you can do things to increase your circulation to help move blood in those areas. And you can do things like dry brushing, for example. And they have got certain kind of scrubs and things that you can use on your skin to promote collagen production as well. So it can be a two, well, I don't really like that saying. I was gonna say you can kill two birds with one stone. Let's go straight out and in. But I don't like that saying. So two for the price of one, if you're doing that scrubbing, you are slightly damaging the skin, stressing the skin. And that can then, as long as you've got the right nutrition, can promote collagen production. So it's another thing that you can consider. Using those creams, maybe just using some sort of cream that is very, um, you know, like rich and maybe natural. Something that really works for you. Everyone is different, so I don't want to recommend anything at all. But something that hydrates the skin as well as creates some, a little bit of a barrier so that your body can really keep all the moisture in and moisture definitely helps with elasticity and healthy skin forward and back, forward and back. So I'm just tapping here, but if you want to, you can lift that knee. So all of those things would definitely help. In terms of fat loss, you know, people will say, well, it's easier said than done. Whenever I lose weight, I find it so hard to lose fat off those areas. And it's true for a lot of women, that is the last area to go because once again, biologically, we are designed to store the most amount of fat there. So it may not be feasible. You may already be very slim and have low body fat. So it may not be feasible for you to actually lose fat or it just would be too strenuous and stressful for you to do so. So what's the other thing that you can do apart from lose fat, other side? The other thing you can do is support the fat with more muscle underneath. So obviously, the more you kind of stre stretch out, I don't know if that's the right word, but the more you have underneath that skin and that fat, the more muscle, the more you're going to push it out and make it look firmer. So it may not be quite as simply if you have supported that whole area of skin with more muscle underneath. So you might be thinking, yeah, but I don't really want to do heavy weights. I don't really enjoy doing that. Well, perhaps you don't need to. Perhaps there are other ways of creating muscle without having to do super heavy weights. Let's go into a wide plie, down, and then see how I'm lifting one toe, lift the other toe. There have been studies done recently that have proven that people that increase their protein intake can increase muscle mass in their body without ex extra exercise. Now I was like, what, are you sure? But I've heard this said more than once on various podcasts. So, are you eating enough protein? It's definitely something that a lot of people struggle with because it's quite difficult to eat enough protein each day. So maybe for a short period of time, you can track it. 
You know, a lot of people don't like tracking because you can make it quite obsessive and then you can be a little bit, yeah, just obsessed with it and socially it's not really that great because when you go out, you're going to be thinking, let's go out, out, in, in, keeping low. Imagine you're in a crawl space. So I do understand that, but even if you just measure for a short time, so just say for a month, measure, weigh the protein you're eating when you can, and see if you're hitting a good amount of protein. Use a protein calculator online. How much protein should you be eating? It's something like a gram per pound of body weight, I've heard. And if you're doing heavier weights, you might need to eat more as well. Protein is one of those macronutrients that unfortunately people don't get enough of as they age. And along with muscle wastage as you get older as well, it's really a terrible recipe for promoting just an unhealthy body that is more prone to injury. Okay, let's go across, across, low, front and front. Stay low, across, across, front and front. So eating enough protein, clean protein, detoxing, eating enough of all your fruits and veggies and your vitamins. They say eat 30 different colored fruits and veggies a week. If you can do that, that's amazing. Doing your exercises that promote lymphatic drainage, like your rebounding or even just jumping around. It doesn't have to be on the rebounder. Even these walking workouts, sometimes there is that little bouncy element to them. That definitely helps. Doing things like dry brushing can also help and using creams that lock in moisture and muscle building. As I said, you do not have to do heavy weights. Let's just go side to side, side to side. Pick up that knee and crunch towards it. You do not need to do heavy weights. Look at ballerinas, for example, or gymnasts. Look at their bodies, how muscly they are and they don't sit there and do heavy weights. It's all about resistance, time under tension, and finding workouts that are challenging. So when you're doing a workout and you've done it for the hundredth time, because it's your favorite workout, you're probably not finding it very challenging anymore, let's face it. So what can you do? You can either add some equipment to it, Maybe add some ankle weights, add a resistance band, add some heavier weights, they don't have to be super heavy. Or you can elevate. Let's go forward, forward, back, step, forward, forward, back, step, side to side. How about we change the arms? Forward, forward, back, back. So yeah, you can definitely just increase the intensity of your favorite workout or branch out. Try something new. This is actually what I would recommend to people not to stick with what you're always used to doing. Most people kind of get into a tendency to do their favorite workouts, but there are literally hundreds and hundreds out there, thousands and thousands. So don't let your body get used to what you are doing. Make sure you keep changing it up. I would recommend once a month, change things up completely. You know, depending on, let's go march in place again. Depending on what sort of workouts you like, try not to always do the same thing. Once again, journaling is an amazing way of keeping track of what works for you. You might do a month of mostly cardio and you might find you lose a lot of body fat. Then you might do a month of all bar workouts and you find you build some amazing definition in your legs, in your butt, in your calves even, because you're up on your toes so much. Then you might do a month of just cardio sculpt, a little bit of everything, a little bit of toning, a little bit of cardio. You can change it up constantly. Say every month or so, change your calendar, and do something new and your body will thank you for it. 
because it's going to be shocked into giving you new results. And then if you keep track of it in a journal, you're going to be able to make sure that, let's go one, two, three, tap, one, two, three, tap. You can make sure that you know what actually works for you. And if it doesn't work for you, and you're finding even after one or two weeks, you're getting maybe less energetic, or you're injuring yourself more, then just don't do that type of workout again. Consistency trumps intensity. Okay, I've said this before, and I'm saying it again because it's so true. Finding workouts that you enjoy and doing them consistently is much more likely going to give you the results that you want than finding workouts that are super high intensity but that you have a dread factor doing and that you find every excuse under the sun to not do it. So the last element that I want to talk to you about, let's go diagonal leg raises to the corner, is mindset. Mindset is ultra important when it comes to fat loss. So what is the link? You've heard me talk about this before if you've done some of my other walk-in talks. But basically, when you are thinking positively, you tend to be happier. Your thoughts dictate how you feel. So if you're able to have a positive mindset even during a difficult time, then overall you're sending the message that you're happier, which means your body will be less stressed. And in order for your body to burn fat, you can't be in a stressed out state. So back in the day, that fight or flight, that stress state, happened for a good reason. If for example, let's go side, center, side, center. If for example, you were getting chased by a lion, it would be perfectly reasonable for your body to pump you full of cortisol and adrenaline and put all your blood in your extremities so you can run. But in today's society, the stresses we endure don't come from actual stresses most of the time, actual threats. They mostly come from perceived threats that we think up in our anxious and overactive minds. Now, not in all cases, obviously in some cases they're actual threats, but often we just great at thinking ourselves stressed. And that state of stress does not provide an environment for losing fat. It's not a relaxed state where your body can start cleaning up house. Let's go skate, skate across. I'm slightly hinging at the hips. So I highly recommend that you start learning to tune into your body. Find some quiet moments every now and then just take a few deep breaths and just listen to your body. Tune in. Are you anxious right now? Most of the time you can figure out when you're anxious. Your heart rate tends to go up. You start breathing more shallow. Maybe start breathing more quickly. You start to maybe sweat a little bit. You could have fluttering in your chest. There are many different signs for every person that there is something going on that's making you go into that fight or flight mode. So we're gonna go L-shaped arms, step out to the side, a little bit of hip if you want it, otherwise just keep it really tap, tap like that. So try to take a little bit of time, like literally five minutes a day when you're feeling flustered about something, when you're feeling stressed and like life is a bit too much, check in with yourself. See what those signs are that tell you you're stressed. And once you learn to identify them, that's going to set you up for being able to stop yourself from spiraling. Something that I talked about recently is learning to choose a better thought. 
Not a perfect thought, but when you find yourself getting really upset about something, whether it's anxiety about the future, whether it's just stress, come back to walking, whether it's just a feeling of stress and overwhelm about all the things you need to do in life, maybe it's someone that's getting on your nerves, maybe it's a child that's going off the rails, maybe it's a health condition. There are so many reasons every single day of our lives that we can feel anxious and stressed. But if we can just learn to listen to our body and stop some of those stresses, those times of stress from escalating and continuing for the whole day or for a few hours or maybe for a week or more, that's when we can start to gain control back over our bodies. And it's literally one moment at a time, one day at a time. It's a mindset of choosing to catch your thinking and to make it slightly better. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, so let's go insole, insole, and then tap back, tap back, and bend into it. It does not have to be a perfect thought. You're not gonna go from being completely angry or completely sad to being joyful. That's not realistic. But choosing a thought, something that maybe you're grateful for, something that, a lesson that you might be learning through whatever situation, there's always something positive you can think about. It doesn't have to even be about that particular situation. It can simply be, for me, the pets, the cute little babies. They bring me so much joy every single day that when I'm sad and I spend some time cuddling them, that just helps me so much. And it may not be anything to do with the situation, but I'm signaling in that moment to my body that it's okay, that I'm gonna be okay, that it's okay to come out of fight or flight, across, across, out to the side. Across, across, side and side. And that's all it needs to learn to self-regulate and calm down when there is only a perceived threat, not even a real threat. And doing that every day becomes a new way of living. You're retraining your brain you're creating new neuro pathways in your brain to learn to just calm yourself down. And then guess what? You do that day in, day out, and you start feeling happier. And what do you do when you're happier? You wanna take care of yourself. You're more motivated. You're more energetic. It's literally a domino effect. You're going to find that so many areas in your life are affected from just taking time out and choosing a better thought in that moment of despair and anxiety. It's crazy. It sounds like, how about we go hip, hip, front and up, front. It sounds like it wouldn't work, but try me. Just try it for a week. Maybe journal it. Once a day, when you're in the middle of some sort of anxious moment, take time out breathe, take some deep breaths. Apparently the best way to change your nervous system is two, two breaths of air in through the nose and one breath out. So, and then. It's like, you know, when babies cry or little children cry and then they start, stop crying and they start kind of doing that breathing, like, you know, that sort of breathing. They're doing that, they're self-soothing. They don't even need to be taught. Same thing. If you do that, you're gonna change your nervous system. Let's go big arms like this, L-shaped arms. You're gonna change your nervous system and signal that everything's okay. So just do that for me. Tell me in the comments below whether you do it for maybe a week, a month, and whether you feel better. Just one actionable step from this entire 30 minute chat, try it. Even if you think it's BS and it's not gonna work, what have you got to lose? Just try it. And the good thing is that that one positive thought can turn, can lead into another positive thought and another positive thought. And then you can get from being super angry and negative to being okay and eventually to being good. 
And then you look back and you think, what was that all about? Why was I so upset? Why was I so negative? And we always get out of our moods, right? Every mood that you've ever been in, every angry situation, every anxious situation, you've had happiness after that point, right? So it really just depends on how long you choose to stay in the negative emotion. You have got power. Don't think that this is happening to you. You have got power over your physiology. You just have to take control. Get yourself into a different state. Another thing that I like to do is if I'm finding that I'm getting too tunnel vision about something, go and just do 20 jumping jacks. Put on your favorite music, dance to it for a minute or two. Something that changes your state physically will interact with your brain and change your state mentally. It's all connected and the same thing, mentally will affect you physically. So if you're down and out and upset and lying on the sofa, guess what, you're gonna feel like a blob. You're not gonna feel like getting up and working out or doing anything like that. But if you're getting energetic and you're exercising, we're finished by the way, then you're gonna feel so much better. You're gonna fill your body with dopamine, endorphins, and then your brain's gonna be alert because of all that oxygen, and you're gonna feel so much happier about the situation. So trick yourself. When you are on that sofa and you're feeling the most miserable, just get up and just go like this. Just go like this. Just move and maybe go like this and maybe put on a song and just dance a little bit. Hopefully no one's looking. And I guarantee you, even if you're by yourself in your house and you're dancing around like an idiot, you're gonna feel a little bit better, just a tiny bit. Okay, and maybe then you can laugh at yourself. Maybe then you can go, what am I doing with myself? Come on, get up. Give your ego a name. Get up, Susan. Let's go do this. Let's go in the garden and get some fresh air. Let's go and look at a flower. Let's go pat the cat. Susan, we're not sitting there anymore. Okay? That's how you've got to talk to your ego because your ego needs controlling. They're like a naughty little defiant dog. They need training and controlling and you can do it it's all about mindset so i know that last bit veered off quite a bit and maybe wasn't quite as linked to cellulite but i've given you quite a few different pathways to follow definitely look it up yourself get some more information there might be some really scientific videos about cellulite for all those nerdy people that like to know all the ins and outs but in general exercise bouncing around maybe some body brushing, cleaning up your diet, trying to get rid of environmental toxins and learning to choose happiness every single day is gonna get you on your road towards getting rid of some of that pesky little lump. Okay, hope you enjoyed the walk and I will see you again very soon. Bye for now.